Good evening. Let's go ahead and grab those hymn books. 876 to start off tonight. 876, Till the Storm Passes By. Once again, if you're willing, stand with me. 876.
good to be here today or this evening. Beautiful day outside, amen. Looking forward to some more warmer weather. Well, let's bow ourselves in the word of prayer. Lord, we are grateful that we're able to be here tonight. I ask you to just watch over us, guide and protect us, and we ask you these things, your name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Just a few announcements that I'm going to get out of the way here, but before I do that, uh, I've been asked to say a few prayers for the uh, Nelson family. They're under the weather as of right now. Uh, if you can remember to lift them up, and uh, Linda's fighting uh, some more sickness. Uh, ask that you just lift her up. Continue to pray for Mr. and Miss, or Pastor and Mrs. Springer. God just continue to work there. I uh, had a phone call from Brother Ziner today. He told me to tell you folks hello. He loves you. He's looking forward to being here in a couple of weeks. So that being said, let's get into our announcements here. Speaking of Brother Ziner, we have him coming in here April 6th through the 10th at our missions conference. We'll be having a Swanson and a Needham family with us as well. Uh, June 13th through the 17th, we're going to be our, having our camp week. If you look over to the right, which I didn't do this the other day, but there is a baby shower for Emma Lynn, and that is at 11 o'clock here at the church at the gymnasium. And look down in that list, and you'll see where they're registered at there, wherever they're registered. If you want to give them money, give them money as well. But uh, anyway, that is taking place this coming weekend. Did I do good, Dina? Great. She came up here a little bit ago and just yelled at me for not doing this Sunday morning. And uh, I almost wanted to hit the altar after that. No, I'm just kidding. She, she graciously, <laughs> she graciously reminded me. So I uh, appreciate that. Uh, don't forget this Sunday night, Jeff will be filling in for myself. And then uh, March the 13th, uh, I can't even say his name, Randy King will be with us. So some things to look forward to. God been good to you this week? Amen. Well, I'm going to have Sean come back and lead us another song, and we'll go get down to business. All right. Once again, if you're willing, stand with me. 863. We'll work till Jesus comes. 863, please. Also forgot to mention Colton is having surgery tomorrow. Is that still on? So Colton's going to be going in bright and early, or one o'clock? Oh, you get to sleep in. I mean, you can stay up late tonight, sleep in, and take a nap. They'll put you to sleep, but is it just your ACL or a meniscus? One of those. Gotcha. All righty. Well, let's go ahead and turn our Bibles this evening to the book of Genesis, chapter number 20. Genesis, chapter 20. We are on the third week of our theme, A Toxic Believer. 
Tonight we're going to be dealing with the one, you can title this a fibber or a liar, whatever one you like. I kind of like the fibber, uh, it just sounds kind of fun, but uh, we're going to be dealing with that tonight and uh, we're going to see what the Word of God has to say here in the book of Genesis chapter 20, verse number 1. It says, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and Sojourn and Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, She is my sister, and she, even she herself, said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou, didst, did, that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee. And thou shalt live, and if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning, and called all his servants, and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham, and said to him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee, that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister, she is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me at every place, whither we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, uh, we thank you for this night that you've given us. God, I pray that you'd... Uh, um, as we go through your word, I pray that you just, uh, again, use me to be a voice to your people. I pray, Lord, that we be able to see the truth in your word. I pray that our hearts would be attentive to your word as well. Lord, tonight we pray for the Nelsons, uh, that you would just uh, give them a, uh, your healing hand upon them. Let's watch over them, uh, raise and lift them up. We thank you tonight that we're able to uh, uh, come to you with these requests. Lord, I pray for Linda as well, that you just... Uh, undertaken and healing her body she's had a, a a rough month lord of being sick and so god i pray that you just uh, uh continue to bring healing to her again lord be with our pastor continue to strengthen him uh just raise him up from uh from this uh, uh state that he has been in and uh, i pray that you just uh, work there be with mrs springer as well just continue to work and healing her body and we ask you these things in your name amen so grateful that we're able to call upon the lord in our time of need amen well, as we continue our series on a toxic believer, tonight's subjects, uh, subject will be on a lying tongue, if you haven't figured that out already. There are many scriptures that deal with this, and we will see a few of them tonight. I'm going to have you go ahead and turn your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter number 6, and we're going to read three to four verses there, and it's going to kind of help us set up the story here uh, a little bit more. I'm give you an idea of what God actually thinks about a lying tongue. So in Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 16 through 19, it says this, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, Verse number 19, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that sow discord among the brethren. Do you guys see something in that passage that was hinted twice? That I'll tell you something, if something's in the Word of God twice, we need to pay attention to it. Amen? Uh, actually, let me rephrase that. If it's in there once, we still need to rephrase that, uh, pay attention to it. But if it's in there twice, we really ought to put our eyes upon this and say, okay, what's God wanting to teach me here in this section? So before I go even further tonight, we must understand what God hates. And it seems pretty obvious here because it's mentioned twice in the scripture. You think of lying. This can be traced all the way back 
to the Garden of Eden. And we're going to turn to some scripture there here in a little bit. As the serpent appears on Eve, and he begins to twist or distort or lie about what God had said uh, to them. So go ahead and turn here to the book of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, and we'll read in verses 4 through 5 of what the serpent did uh, to Eve that day. It says in verse number three or 4, it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth not know that in the day ye eat thereof. Question, does not God know everything? So there is one of the lies that he's already uh, giving to Eve in this matter. God knows everything. There isn't anything that doesn't get by God. He knows what's going on. So let's read this again. For God doth not know that in the day ye eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be open. And look what he says. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So we just did some tracing back to the very beginning of when man and woman came onto the scene. And lying was uh, already uh, in effect here. So going off of this... And how the serpent had a part in bringing sin into the garden. He played a vital role in this. And so with that being said, I can see why God would hate lying. He has a problem with it. Think about this. He created this world perfect, did he not? And because of the sin that came into the garden, the garden that he created perfect now became an unperfect place. Before this took place, you didn't have to worry about going around pulling weeds. I've had many experiences in our garden at home uh, having to pull weeds. That's a curse. Every time I was out there as a young person pulling those weeds, I would curse Adam and Eve. Seriously, I'd be mad at them. Thank you, Adam and Eve, because now mom and dad think that I got to pull weeds in this garden because you brought a curse upon us. Um, but they didn't have to worry about those things. They didn't have to worry about uh, um, taking care of anything because everything was already taken care of. And here comes Satan, and he begins to destroy those things. So I can see why God would have a problem with this. What I also want you to see is that God does not hate the liar. God hates the lie, but he doesn't hate the liar. So I want to point that out because... I don't want you to go around and say, okay, God hates people. Well, God loves us, but we've got to understand that God hates the sin. So that's what I'm trying to establish here. So this form of a toxic believer can cause harm, just like the one that was critical that we dealt with last week and the week before that as we dealt with the one who was a gossiper in a church. Uh, this, too, can cause harm to the body of Christ. And uh, hopefully we can see this a little bit later on. So a liar can also be known, as I said a little while ago, as a fibber. Some will also say a little white lie won't hurt a thing. Has anybody ever heard that? Well, I just told a, wi a, a little white lie. That's, it, it's nothing big. No, a, a white lie is, it's a lie. Plain and simple. Even as you look here in the book of, of Genesis chapter number 20, we can say that Abraham had a white lie. He didn't tell the whole truth. As you go through later on in the chapter, he begins to explain the truth. She is my sister of my father, but not of my mother. He didn't finish the story there. So he, he started off with a white lie, and this white lie could have really damaged a lot of people. But a white lie is a lie. If that is the case, then why did God come to Abimelech as he was sleeping into a dream. God was interfering because Abraham, through his little white lie, could have ruined a nation and could have ruined a king as well. You see how a toxic believer, whatever form of, tox, of toxins they, they bring into the body of Christ, can bring damage? It doesn't take much. It just takes one little gossip to offend the whole body. It just takes one little person being critical about one little thing, and that can ruin the body of Christ. 
And then you can take just one little lie that can cause harm to the body of Christ. A white lie can hurt a lot of people. So what was this lie? Or could we say, what was this partial truth, but not the whole truth? Abraham had journeyed to uh, Gerar, and he was met by Abimelech, king of Gerar. For some reason, Abraham had felt that he needed to lie about his relationship with Sarah. And we see later on in this chapter, it begins to explain why he did this. In verse number 11, it says, And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Problem here is Abraham should have been honest from the get-go. Should have been straight up with him, telling him the truth from the very beginning. Because now, after this, I would find it hard to believe anything that would come out of the mouth of Abraham at this point in time. For this reason, because he has been proven to be a liar. And so, uh, it's very important for us to understand honesty is the better route to go. It, it, it truly is. You know, if you messed up in life, just admit it. Just agree that you did it instead of trying to cover up with a lie. Because then what normally happens is this. You're going to cover up that lie with another lie with another lie. Then you're going to forget where you're at. And then you're going to have to uh, retrace your steps and start off with another lie. That's what normally takes place. Then people look at you as a habitual liar. And that's not a good thing either. So this is what took place there. Abraham's lie had put his own wife in a place of awkwardness. So here's what was taking place. Abraham, he comes up on the scene of Gerar, the king of, uh, the king of, uh, the, uh, the king is there, Abimelech. And uh, he says, hey, uh, King Abimelech, this is my sister. So King Abimelech, he's looking at her. Obviously, Sarah probably was an attractive lady. That would be, uh, I, I would just have to imagine that. And so Abimelech's looking at her. Oh, okay, this isn't your wife. This is just your sister. And so Abimelech is going to take her back home. And there could have been some things that would have taken place that could have caused a lot of harm. Uh, as we continue to go on to this, what I was getting at, Abimelech had taken her to have relations with him. But God intervened through a dream here. We might not think nothing of this because in the Old Testament, it was common for men to have not one wife, but multiple wives. And if they didn't only have, if they only had, if they had multiple wives, some would also take on the form of concubines. And they would have uh, children with these. Uh, Abraham, he had a child uh, with one of his concubines, or uh, with Sarah's handmaid. Isaac wasn't the firstborn. And so as we continue to go on here, so we might not think of nothing of this, because, okay, this is just a common thing here. But let me say this. Even though this had taken place, God had never said that this was right. Because when you go into the New Testament, when you get the qualifications of the pastor, what's one of those qualifications? Not just a pastor, a bishop, but a deacon as well, is a husband of one wife. You know, the reason why that was said, because they practiced polygamy back then. Man, if a, a pastor had multiple wives and, and concubines, that dude's in a lot of trouble. Imagine trying to pastor church and trying to keep all these women in line. That'd be a big mess. And that's no offense to you ladies. Don't, don't get me wrong here. I, I'm not looking at you ladies right now for a reason because I can see daggers coming at me. Uh, but that's not, that's not to put you <laughs> down by, by any mean. But God had never said that this was right. And I'm going I'm to explain this just a little bit because I'm going to go back to Adam and Eve once again. When God created Adam and Eve, they were all that they had. There is no one else. Marriage was created for one man and woman till death they do part. Let me say this again. 
Marriage was created for one man and one woman till death they do part. You mean there's no other excuses? No. There, there's no other excuses. Now, do things happen? Yes, I understand things happen. I, I get those things. I understand there's some folks that had marriages that uh, they didn't have a safe partner and things didn't work out. I, I understand those things. But as I continue to go on, after that, then the whoever has been left behind, if one was the past, can remarry again if they choose to. Now, we have seen uh, many preachers who have lost their wives, missionaries as well, and, and uh, some have, they've remarried. And that's fine because they commit, they, they, they made a commitment to their spouse. They stay committed to her until death took them home. And now they had the, uh, he had the right to, to go remarry. And so uh, they, they had the right to do those things. As I continue to go on here, I want to point something out here. A marriage is God-ordained. God brought the family together. And we've got to realize that it wasn't man bringing a family together. It wasn't woman, but it was God himself who brought family together. Because out of the rib of Adam came Eve. When Eve came to this world, Eve became the wife, the spouse of Adam. God ordained. And since it's God ordained, a marriage should always be honored that way should always be honored that way. Unfortunately, it's not like that in our world today. Some say, well, you know, divorce rates have gone down. You know why? Can I tell you why divorce rates have gone down? Because they have. They've gone down drastically. Because no one's getting married, exactly. They're, they're living together. And uh, uh, they're, they're going against what, what God has, has uh, given us in Scripture. So, uh, honored marriage because it's God ordained. I believe right here, as we go through the story, Abraham put his wife's life in jeopardy, and I'm talking, I'm talking relation wise, and he wasn't fulfilling his commitment to uh, his wife at that time. He wasn't being honorable to her, and he was allowing someone else to, let's put it this way to have lust towards her. And because there's lust, there's feelings that take place, and relations could have taken place after this. So marriage is, needs to be honored. If we're to see how the Bible sees marriage, and not through our eyes that have been polluted, marriage would have a whole new meaning. You know who's really corrupted marriage? Think about this real quick. Hollywood. Hollywood. Now we have shows on there called The Bachelor, or they have another show called The Bachelorette, which, by the way, I will say this, I will never be on The Bachelor for this reason. It's wrong. <laughs> yes, and I'm married. I was getting to that. Exactly. Exactly. That was a good one, Chris. Yeah. See, things come to me slow. <laughs> but what has taken place in, in these shows is this. They have turned marriage into a buffet style. So here's, here's the picture. We got a row of chairs up here. They'll come in and they'll, they'll line all these women up here or whatever show it is and they'll line these men up here and they'll begin to go through these men and women and during this process, they will have relations with them. Marriage is not about a buffet. It, it truly isn't. Hollywood has ruined what marriage is. Now, I, I grew up in a different era, not, not an era that some of you, the elderly folk, grew up in. But when I grew up, we were able to have uh, cable TV came in our house when I was about... Uh, 11, 12 years of age, and uh, we didn't have remote controls. We had a, a thing on the box, a, a box on the TV, and you, it went, fruit, fruit. I mean, you can turn the channels real, it had a, real, a clicking sound to it. It's, it was really cool. And you talk about being nostalgic there, that's pretty neat. 
But uh, uh, I remember when that came, when we got that in our house, uh, there was a, a, a channel on it. I think it was called Nickelodeon, if I remember, or something like that. But it, was, it wasn't what it is right now. But we're able to see what my folks were able to watch, and that was Leave it to Beaver where a husband and wife or an actual husband and wife, they were a family. They had shows around families. Now it's not like that. Hollywood's really corrupted these things. Anyway, as I continue to go on, it doesn't mean that because of this that there won't be any problems. Let's be honest. Marriage, marriage has problems. Abraham created a big problem here. I tell you what, if I would have done that to my wife, I know her right hook. I know I would have had her right hook, her left hook, and her right foot right behind it. I don't know why I said that, but it sounded good. Oh, we'll have problems. But just because we have problems doesn't mean that we don't work through them. We've got to work through our problems. What does it mean? It, it, it'll, here, here's what I want us to understand. Because marriage is God-ordained, and God brought a husband and wife together, when you do have those problems, guess what? Guess who's cheering you on? It's God. God's cheering you on. God's in your corner. He's backing you up. Thank God for that. God made it very clear that Abimelech had taken another man's wife, another man's wife. And if he was going to continue in this, the Bible says that he would be a dead man. I bet you that Abimelech was very thankful for the dream that he had that night. Because God intervened. Because God knew if he didn't intervene, what would take place. Why is this important? Because you go to chapter number 21. What do you read about? You read about Sarah conceiving a child named Isaac. You see what would have happened or could have happened if Abimelech and Sarah would have gotten together because of a white lie? You see how toxic lying can be? You see what it can destroy? So he would be a dead man if he was continued. Before I continue, there are a few things to look at. I, I just... I wrote down that I thought were might be beneficial to us men here. And so women, uh, hold us men to this. But I saw a problem with Abraham in this chapter. Abraham had a tremendous opportunity to be the protector of his wife. Men, we are to protect our wives. Be your wife's protector. Why? Because God's given her to us. She's vulnerable. And we, we got to be there to help. The Bible says they're our weaker vessel. And so we got to be their protector. The second thing I wrote down here, it should be quite obvious, is this. Abraham said a white lie. Okay? He said, it's not my wife, this is my sister. Didn't tell the whole truth, but... Here's what I got out of this. Number two, be proud of your wife. Amen? Be proud of her. What do you mean? Well, I'm just going to be blunt. Be proud of her if she's ugly. Be proud of her if she's pretty. Because God gave her to you. Be proud of her no matter how anybody else looks at her. She's your treasure. She's your prize. She, she's your gift from God. So be proud of her. God has given her to you and to nobody else. She is something to be treasured. Abraham's lie had become toxic to a king and to his nation. All could have been lost because of a white lie, or let's just say a lie. I find a verse in Proverbs that would have been very helpful to Abraham. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 23 says this. It says, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. 
I think this verse would have been very beneficial for Abraham during his time. Hey, Abraham, keep your mouth shut because it will save you from a lot of trouble. You know, that being said, sometimes, guys, when we get into some heated, um, uh, intense fellowship moments with our wives, sometimes we just need to keep our mouth shut. I'm going to say this for this reason, because we need to listen to them. It's not about proving our side. It's not about proving how right we are and trying to prove how wrong they are. Shut your mouth. All you lady said? Oh, okay, I guess I was wrong on that one. <laughs> Moving right along. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Don't be fooled. Lying takes place in the church as well. And a person who is a liar is one who is toxic. No matter how you look at a lie, a lie is a lie. Whether it's small or big or even a white lie, it is a lie. It takes place all around us. Kids lie. We see that all the time. Go to any, any playground, any schoolyard or whatever, you're going to see kids lie. Kids lie about sports. Kids lie about their schoolwork. They lie about anything that they can think of. So why do kids lie? Well, okay, you ask the question, why? Because parents lie. They learn it from their parents. Co-workers lie. Anybody you can think of, they lie. Just because this takes place doesn't mean that we are to fall in line with it. Turn your Bibles, you should already be there, pretty close to it, Proverbs chapter 12. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 12, and I'm almost done here. Verse number 22 says this. It says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. You see what a lying lips is to God? It's an abomination. A fibber slash liar, I'll say it this way, grieves the heart of God. It grieves the heart of God. It should be noted once you begin lying, you hurt people. You hurt people. And then when you do start to tell the truth, here's what happens. And I said it a little while ago with Abraham. They find it very hard to believe you. Why? Because you've already been proven to be a liar. And so what you have done, you've created people around you to be skeptical of you. Which is why I say it's always good to come up with the truth. You go to a courtroom... Someone's always lying there. You got the person who's facing death row lying his way out of it so he doesn't have to go to death row. They're full of liars. By the way, I found this out. Every person who almost, every person I've known of that sits in a jail cell believe that they are innocent. They're there for some reason. Now I know that through DNA and all that stuff that's happened, there have been on rare occasions, some false accusations, and they have been set free. But a majority of people who sit in the prisons believe they're actually innocent. What are they doing? They're lying to themselves. They're lying to themselves. The best thing to do is always be honest. Honesty will go further with people. It's hard for people to trust those who lie. And let me say this, in finding friends, will be difficult to surround yourself with. A church that is filled with just one liar can cause a church to become toxic. Again, the purpose of the series is to not point fingers at anybody else, but to examine ourselves. One of the things that I was accused of, most people, my, my siblings probably don't even remember this, but I was accused at one point in time in my life early on that I was an habitual liar that has always, always stuck with me. And I'll never forget that. So we got to examine ourselves so that we won't make the body of Christ toxic. John 14, verse number 6, says it best. It says, I am the way, the truth, 
You want to know who to be like? Be like Jesus. Why? Because it says it right here. He's the truth. Amen? When he says truth, that means everything that he says is true. Thankful, I'm thankful for a God who has always been honest with us and truthful with us from the very beginning. Thankful for that. And with that being said, you and I, because we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we're a part of this body, we should always be honest with each other. Now, let me give you some, a piece of advice here. That doesn't mean that we're going to go up to somebody and say, hey, I don't like your outfit. Okay? Well, Chad, you said you got to be honest. Now, I'm, I'm talking in a different sense. I'm not talking about how somebody dressed. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about if you don't like their car, things of that nature, okay? When you're asked a question, be truthful with your answer, okay? Be truthful with your answer. Let's bow ourselves in a word of prayer, and we will be dismissed tonight. Lord, we are grateful tonight that we're able to be here. Uh, I pray as we leave from here tonight, you'd uh, give us safety home. Uh, watch over us, and uh, Lord, I just pray for our upcoming missions conference that you just uh, uh, be with uh, Brother Ziner as you have already laid upon his heart what he's wanting to teach. I, I pray that you just uh, continue to give him more clarity. Be with our missionaries that are coming in. Uh, what a good time it is for us to uh, fellowship with them once again. I ask that you.